From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Microsoft issues a massive phishing warning. Callback phishing scams impersonate security companies and will log for JB with us forever. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Carla Sweeney, the VP Information Security at Red Ventures. Carla, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Before we get into our conversation, which I can't wait for, we have to thank our sponsor, EdgeScan, necessary protection for your attack surface. Remember, you can join us on LinkedIn Live to do so. Just navigate to CISOseries.com in your browser of choice. Look for the Week in Review page. You can find the link there. Get involved with the chat. Let us know what you think of the stories as we are doing this. I will not wait for you, though. I don't mean to be rude, but we only have about 20 minutes, so let's hop into it. Our first story today, Microsoft warns of a massive phishing operation. The company warned of a series of phishing attacks targeting over 10,000 organizations, which we now know qualifies as massive, since September 2021. These attacks use landing pages designed to spoof the Office Online Authentication page. This steals credentials and session cookies, even for users using multi-factor authentication. These are then used to access mailboxes for business email compromise attacks, the old classic. Microsoft suggests organizations implement MFA with certificate-based authentication and FIDO 2.0 support to mitigate this scheme. It maintained that while some implementations of MFA are vulnerable to these phishing approaches, it should remain an essential pillar in identity security. You know, Carla, I, I'm just curious about your thoughts about the, the practicality of this. Obviously, Microsoft and a, and a lot of other uh, security advocates out there want as many layers of authentication for MFA. Makes sense. But you start running into things like user fatigue or simply threat actors being threat actors and finding a way much like life. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, when you see a, an apartment uh, in, in New York in a movie and they have like 20 locks on the door, it's just kind of that. When does it approach that parody almost? Do you see any other ways for organizations to protect themselves or will we be playing cat and mouse forever? Yeah, great question. I think MFA is a critical control and is definitely essential in identity security as well as the other authentication mechanisms that you mentioned. Um, and they're not bulletproof on their own. I think we threat actors are going to find ways to circumvent any control over time. And so we really shouldn't relax our defenses around phishing just because MFA is implemented. I think this story really highlights the importance of applying layers of controls and defense in depth to defend against these sorts of attacks. Training, testing, email security tools and mechanisms, multi-factor authentication, not just two-factor authentic authentication, um, least privilege, network segmentation, lots and lots of controls to defend against these these systemic sort of attacks. So there's definitely a benefit to not having an over-reliance on just one control when it comes to phishing, especially. All right. Well, moving on, another phishing story, callback phishing scams impersonating security companies. A new report from CrowdStrike deals a callback phishing campaign with threat actors impersonating CrowdStrike. Over the past year, the actors would leave messages with companies claiming to be from the security vendor, asking them to call back to resolve a problem or cancel a subscription. Once an organization calls back, the attackers use social engineering to get them to install remote access software. In an update to the campaign, the attackers warn recipients of malicious network intruders compromising workstations, requiring an in-depth security audit that requires access to a device. So I guess just, just really going specifically for endpoints there. Carla, another story of mean threat actors using live communication to push victims to believing their scams. It's kind of like the, hey, there's a problem with your Amazon order text that all of us got and give you, a, you know, a link to click through. It's obvious that many average employees will go along with this because they feel like they're doing the right thing. You know, they want to be security conscious or they don't want a, a security contract to lapse on their watch or something like that. What can management do internally to further street smart uh, you know, organizations. I think continuing to provide education and awareness of how people should expect to interact with security teams or vendors. We're all in a hurry. And, and by and large, everyone wants to do the right thing. But would you expect to hear directly from a security vendor without a heads up from the internal team if there was an audit? Probably not. For, for certain teams that might regularly 
interact with vendors. Well, this might mean additional or extra training in how they interact. Um, and then just continuing education is so important. Testing with your own internal phishing campaigns or even pen tests to see how you're doing and then using those layers of controls that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I, I do wonder, you know, I know there is some, uh, uh, you know, kind of, you know, like internal phishing testing to, to I, I, as a form of pen testing, you know, to kind of test employees. I know that sometimes that gets a bad rap, but I feel like if it's low stakes with this kind of emulation being like approaching from a known vendor uh, and, and obviously not having punitive action, using it for educational purposes, I do think that would be a good way to kind of uh, get people to think, all right, what are the right avenues for people uh, to be thinking about, you know, how we're communicating with people that we think we can trust? Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's happening in the wild. And so if people are thinking, oh, no, how could you you inside do this to me? It's happening. So we want to make sure that we're prepared all in the spirit of edu of education. And shout out to last week's guest, David Cross, commenting on LinkedIn. Are security companies the new phishing identities that all companies need training? Uh, uh, David, thank you uh, uh, for that. I think I think, yeah, the, the education component of that uh, is uh, is is key to kind of Again, uh, not to say zero trust, but to say like questioning how we're interacting uh, from that kind of insider, almost like an insider threat uh, kind of situation. Our next story here, endemic log4j software flaw could take years to address US government, uh, US government review fines. It could take a decade to fully eradicate log4j from some computer systems. That's according to a Department of Homeland Security Review Board uh, a report this week. The review board, which the White House established last year to investigate major cybersecurity incidents, called on the government and the private sector to invest much more in securing the open source software that underpins global IT infrastructure. But while there were reports of ransomware gangs and governments from China to Turkey exploiting the software vulnerability, the high-impact hacks that some analysts anticipated have yet to materialize, according uh, to the panel. So, Carla, this has parallels, you know, kind of to the Rogers Internet story that we're going to be talking about here in just a little bit. In the case of Log4j, we're looking at a fundamental infrastructure oper op operation. Do you think it's better that we keep a universal product and focus on more vigilance, or should we diversify? That one's tough because I think we're always going to be reliant on a diverse set of technology that comes with that each comes with its own inherent risks. So we can't say like for a company that we are only ever going to have to worry about Log4j and the set of risks that comes with that and future exploitations that might come with that. So I'm not sure it's possible to, at this point to keep a universal product and avoid the plethora of risks inherent with using a variety of technology. That said, there's definitely a balance between using an endless amount of technology and ensuring that you can remain diligent uh, from a vigilance standpoint on the set of technologies that are used. So I know you asked me which one it's it's I don't think it's either or, <laughs> but there's probably a middle line somewhere. Is this a this isn't anything new, like these kind of endemic vulnerabilities? I think that was this that was like the buzzword that I saw coming out of this report. It's just this is another one that we have to look out for, right? This is not a new concept, right? No, no. I think this is one more that we have to watch out for. All right. Next up here, FTC is cracking down on false claims of anonymizing data. The, uh, this last Tuesday, the FTC warned tech companies against making deceptive data anonymization claims. The FTC is essentially focusing on companies collecting user location information and passing it off to third parties. Acting Associate Director of the Commission's Privacy Division, Kristen Cohen, said significant research has shown that anonymized data can often be re-identified, especially in the context of location data. So, Carla, this is an example of the Biden administration kind of, you know, uh, really taking a serious look at, uh, you know, kind of cybersecurity or cyber privacy uh, uh, as a whole in the form of an executive order that urges the FTC to protect the privacy of consumers seeking out reproductive health services. The FTC is prepared to sue offenders, which could result in U.S. court imposing civil penalties. I'm curious, what are your thoughts about the ability of anonymized data to be re-identified? This doesn't sound like decryption activity, simply a method of refinding information. I know it's not quite the same, but I, 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 I know like rehydrating data. It, it's almost, you know, reassociating location with users or at least creating strong connections. Did this look like a gaping security hole to you? It's really difficult to actually anonymize data. Um, it just there's so many ways to rehydrate. And in the health context, particularly in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade and the consequences to reproductive services and and potential criminalization for both healthcare providers and individuals, it's so concerning to think about motivations to re-identify.
by this sort of data. Like when we think about the potential harm or degree of harm or consequence of unauthorized access to that data, then yes, definitely huge security concerns. We want to make sure that that data, even in its anonymized uh, or pseudonymized form, is, is protected. But I think questions around data use and the risk factors definitely need to weigh into business decisions on whether that data should be shared or even retained um, with with this heightened risk. Yeah, I, I think that's the what stood out to me of this is obviously like any specifics the FTC gets right. There, there are so many different approaches to anonymizing data, you know, kind of across the board. But the idea of, OK, we're going to put teeth on this to make organizations ask, is this worth the compliance risk to keep this data? I feel like that is that to me seems like the most effective way as opposed to, you know, specific mandates. Right. Yeah, at least should we even be using it this way? All right. Well, before we move on, we want to spend a few moments with our sponsor, EdgeScan. EdgeScan simplifies vulnerability management by delivering a single full stack solution integrated with world class security professionals. Instead of managing a plethora of point scanning tools for each layer of the attack surface and squandering precious staff resources manually removing false positives, EdgeScan offers automated and accurate contextualized alerts across the entire attack surface into a single source of truth. Learn more at edgescan.com. Next here, Rogers CEO apologizes for massive service outage, blames maintenance update. Last Friday, mobile and internet uh, subscribers in Canada experienced a massive network outage, which extended from coast to coast and impacted 911 operations, point of sale terminals, and communications for individuals and businesses. The outage lasted 20 hours. The CEO of the affected provider, Rogers Communications, said that it was not a cyber attack, but was instead a network system failure following a maintenance update in our core network, which caused some of our routers to malfunction. You know, Carla, experts are calling this a learning opportunity for threat actors, including Russian state-sponsored actors, who can now see how vulnerable Canadian industry, financial institutions, healthcare systems are to an attack on a telecom provider, something that can be applied to any country. Is the fact that this wasn't wasn't a cyber attack, but the result of a switchover being done in the early hours of weekday actually worse in some ways? Does this give threat actors, I don't know, additional leverage if we were to say use social engineering to gain advanced knowledge of a company's critical upgrade? Absolutely. I mean, this outage may not have been caused by a cyber attack, but availability is definitely a security concern. And I do think that having a clearer picture like this of the impact of such an outage is exactly what makes critical infrastructure providers such high value targets. So yes, I absolutely think that any bit of public information about how vulnerable a company's resilience capabilities are can and will be used by threat actors. Yeah, and the idea with this is obviously not any kind of, like I'm not worried about this in terms of financial loss, although obviously businesses were impacted by not even if they're not able to be open or something like that. Uh, and certainly healthcare organizations are impacted. But in terms of when we're talking about state sponsored actors, where a lot of the times the goal is to cause chaos, cause uncertainty, uh, uh, you know, just cause confusion. It, this to me, uh, one, not only shows the impact of hitting these providers, but also kind of provides a roadmap of, okay, this is how this, these are now, now we also know the response uh, kind of capabilities uh, at this point in time. Obviously, hopefully, Canada and and other nations can can learn from this and kind of uh, you know learn how to uh, uh, I guess anticipate outages like this in the event of a cyber attack. But that also seems like a major cause for concern, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Nine one one emergency services rendered powerless. That's pretty scary. Yeah, absolutely. So glad. Uh, I mean, glad it was only twenty hours. Sad that it had to be twenty hours uh, in the end of it. Next up here, a medical debt collection firm says ransomware attack exposed information on six hundred fifty healthcare organizations. In a statement issued late last week, the collection agency Professional Finance Company said that during the February attack, the Quantum Ransomware Group used the Bumblebee malware loader to gain access to databases that held all types of personal information, including financial and medical information for clients' patients. Its role as a debt collection firm means healthcare organizations provide the company with information on patients or customers that have not paid. PFC said it notified the 657 companies in May. So, you know, Carla, looking past the irony that a collection agency took three months to own up to its own transgressions, are medical debt collection companies not bound by HIPAA? If not, shouldn't they be? 
They absolutely are as a business associate of the health healthcare organizations that they contract with. So these organizations do inherit HIPAA obligations. So in notifying healthcare organizations that they had this, this issue, the PFC also had to notify the Department of Health and Human Services, OCR, which they did. And in that report claimed to have lost nearly 2 million records. So, you know, the HIPAA security rule, breach notification rules, they're really meant to protect individuals' health data. So when a third party is helping out and providing services to these healthcare providers, they're held to the same standards. So tough day for those 2 million individuals, the providers and PFC. Yeah, d- definitely. Uh, uh, c- coming up next here, a uh, government contractor pays $9 million over whistleblower allegations. Aerojet Rocketdyne, a rocket contractor for the likes of DOD and NASA, has, uh, has paid a $9 million settlement for misrepresenting its compliance with U.S. government security requirements. Brian Marcus, senior, uh, a former senior director of cybersecurity at Aerojet, alleged the company lied about its cybersecurity policies to win more contracts and that the company experienced data breaches in 2014 and 2015. Marcus filed the claim under the DOJ's False Claims Act Civil Cyber Defense Initiative, launched in October last year. This was the first case in which a former employee attempted to bring action on the government's behalf for alleged cybersecurity fraud. Under the False Claims Act whistleblower provisions, Marcus will receive $2.1 million of the settlement. So, Carla, this is not the first story that we've seen regarding large companies who enjoy large government contracts falsifying data about security or breaches. Given the amount of proactive activity the current administration has been showing overall, we talked about it earlier, do you feel more should be done to vet these large players or do they kind of just fit into the too big to fail bucket? I do think that for an industry like aerospace, where the stakes are incredibly high from a safety and security standpoint, there should be more vetting. Um, That said, more vetting is not always going to identify every weakness that we think it will. And my personal belief is that in many cases, third party risk assessments are largely theater. Um, But I think this story really highlights an issue in trust. The story wasn't that Aerojet Rocketdyne wasn't compliant. It was that it lied about it. So like again, in, in industries like aerospace, really security and safety need to be prioritized and that requires investment. I wonder what it would take or what it would have taken for Aerojet Rocketdyne to really invest in security to the point where compliance is an outcome. Uh, I, I'm hoping the the government is, is wondering that as well, <laughs> for sure, uh, going forward. Uh, and last up here, pen testers say uh, the broke into a, a, a pen tester says he broke into a data center through hidden route running behind toilets. Security consultant Andrew Tierney, who works as a consultant for Pentest Partners, revealed on Twitter how he managed to gain unauthorized access to a data center when he discovered that the toilet facilities for an unnamed client's general office space and the secure area where IT infrastructure is housed had a shared access space for servicing both sets of facilities. Flush with his success, Tierney noted that he had just managed to defeat the data center security protection, which involved man trap entry gates where personnel had to surrender all digital devices upon entry. Even worse, the toilet layout was visible for all to see on public planning documents, meaning that anyone could have figured out how to bypass security. He single-handedly gave new meaning to the term, and I'm sorry, IP access. All right, so Carla, you know, uh, obviously uh, the opportunities for toilet humor, my forte, uh, were irresistible. But the more pressing urgency with this story is just how easy it is to overlook weaknesses in a system when they don't fit into standard usage patterns. In this case, everyone had their eye on the front door, bathrooms were overlooked because they don't fit into that typical usage profile. Yet threat actors are always looking for these types of opportunities or for some sort of Ocean's Eleven elaborate scheme. Would you think this story would be a good case for you know teaching threat analysis? Yes, absolutely. I think the focus in a threat analysis has to be on the asset and all the ways it could be exploited. So not only on whether the use standard use case is secure, but any way uh, that could be exploited. So if we use this case as an analogy where unauthorized access to the data center is the crown jewel, I mean, threat actors are investing their time into finding ways into the data centers. And so we should be investing time to consider this proactively for our most critical things, um, whether it's applications, the actual data center, et cetera, um, before those threat actors are making that same investment and using it to our detriment. So um, I, I love this story. Just I just thought it was funny, <laughs> um, but I do, like the, I do like the analogy. And I really had to wonder if um, the pen tester here wiped anything on his way out of the data center. 
Oh, oh, Carla. <laughs> Bravo. I, I mean, I, I don't even know why I tried knowing the chops that you have uh, after that. So before we get out of here, I'm sure some of our listeners have some thumbs up. Oh, wait, we hear, uh, we have uh, Renee Gutman uh, wrote in, I heard that people were willing to go to a restaurant and pay over $15 for a bowl of soup so they could have an internet connection. Oh, she's referring Following to the Rogers, Rogers story. Yeah, fo- yep. And then she said it reminds her of the 2002 power outage. Wow. I believe we need uh, to think about resiliency much more in our secure by design. Renee, really appreciate that. Uh, uh, really great points there. Uh, before we get out of here, Carla, any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Something that just kind of got your attention here, really stood out. I I thought the FTC cracking down on on anonymizing data is a big thumbs up. It's a, it's kind of a scary time right now. And thinking about how our data, our search history, our location data could be used against us, um, I am encouraged and hope to see some action coming out of this. All right. Well, thank you, Carla Sweeney, the VP of Information Security at Red Ventures. Where can people find you if they are so inclined? They can find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. 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 And are you hiring the question of the week? Yes, we have a couple of open positions on our security engineering team. Um, You can find those on Red Ventures website. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. And thank you also to our sponsor, EdgeScan, Necessary Protection for your attack surface. Remember to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday, where our topic will be hacking third-party integrations, an hour of critical thinking about securing apps that talk to other apps. Just go to CISOseries.com and click on the Super Cyber Friday icon to register. Of course, we'll be back with another week in review show starting as always, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. And finally, you can get your daily news fix every single weekday through cybersecurity headlines. Give us six minutes, we'll get you all caught up. Until next next week, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 